sound over the top. It just has to. When I keep stressing again and again and again that the greatest single shortcoming of this franchise currently is that the people who are running it on the field and over their heads lack urgency. But every single day the evidence mounts. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is... Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Penguins where you found this. Marlins 6, Pirates 4 last night in Miami. The losing streak is at 10. This one probably was the most painful, not just because they got to double digits, but because there was a 4-1 to one lead in the eighth inning. Dowry Moretta came on, was lousy. He's been lousy for a while now, which maybe should have been considered before bringing him in. Loaded the bases up before there were any outs. And rather than turning to David Bednar, the all-star closer, Barely gets used for anything anymore because, you know, closers, saves, endless losing. Those things don't exactly line up. Derek Shelton turned to Carmen Blaginski, who's been with the Pirates, who's been in Major League Baseball for less than a week. Blaginski comes in, does exactly, exactly, exactly what you would expect a kid to do in that situation. He gives up a bunch of runs, most of them on a three-run homer, and the game is over. And Bednar never budges from the bullpen. The player that you had on your roster, in your lineup, eminently available to help you win a game, to break A very long losing streak that's killing your season just sat there. Now, I'm not on the trip. To the best of my knowledge, Shelton was not asked after the game why he didn't use Bednar. He was asked, however, why he went to Mlodzinski. It takes five minutes where our bullpen is right now. You know, we're we're uh, we're a little depleted down there, especially in leverage. And Carmen's throwing the ball well, and it's a tough spot for him. And you know, unfortunately, it didn't work out. This is indefensible. I'm not someone who looks a lot at managers' decisions or even lineups or stuff like that, and says, "Well, that really cost you the game." This cost you the game. Bednar has pitched. Six total innings in the month of June. He's had four total save opportunities. To his credit, he's nailed down all four of them. All of them came earlier in the month, obviously. So there's been no stress. There's been no wear and tear. There's no reason whatsoever to not bring him in in that situation. Is Bednar great with guys all over the bases? No. Is he better than a child would have been with the bases loaded? Yeah, I'd like to think so. If you're not managing to win the game right in front of you, and if your general manager is not generally managing to win the games that are being played right now, this is not a serious operation. Certainly not in the year 2023. Now, I'm not going to be that told you so guy to bring back all the punt stuff from last fall, but this is what I was told. This wasn't my speculation. This wasn't my uh, interpreting certain remarks this way or that way. I was told that this team was going to essentially punt on 2023. Meaning, they felt very, very good about what they had coming behind this group. They were going to commit something to this one so that they could start talking about winning, start feeling good about winning, being more competitive in general, bringing Andrew McCutcheon back, bringing Carlos Santana and Rich Hill in. 
But then something awful and unthinkable occurred in April, where they won 20 of their first 28 games and had people around baseball and also, incredibly enough, around Pittsburgh talking about them and raising the bar on them. And that clearly wasn't going to do. Nothing was going to change the internal outlook for what this season should have been. If you think I'm just continuing on with a narrative that I began with that reporting last fall, you can go right ahead and think that. But then, in the same thought process, you go ahead and explain to me that managing last night. It's not a serious operation when it comes to the year 2023. They are punting. Forfeiting? No. Throwing things? No, of course not. Trying to finish with another 1-1 overall pick in the draft? No. No, no, no. And that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm pointing out and have been pointing out for months now is that they were never going to prioritize winning. They were never going to do everything that they could to win the games right in front of them. And that means whenever you have bullpen guys go down, go actually find some bullpen guys to replace them. When O'Neill Cruz goes down in April, he can't be replaced, but you can try. You don't just bring up Tucapita Marcano and say, go field the position. They're exasperating. I don't know how you do it. I really don't. When we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern. That's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone. An eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Your front door, your car, your bike, your computer, your gun. Safety is a habit. Every day you lock and secure your home and everything you want to keep safe. Gun safety and responsible storage are no different and the best way to help prevent accidents, misuse, and theft. If you have a firearm, own it, respect it, and secure it. Visit projectchildsafe.org. Brought to you by the National Shooting Sports Foundation and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Today's J1Q comes from Jeff Hoffman. It's a good one. Jeff asks, DK, did the demise of this team begin with the comments made by the general manager that his own people projected this team would finish in fourth place? That would really have bothered me if I was a player. Jeff, I'm not going to lie. I have not heard a single player bring up Charrington's comments, and I don't expect to. Baseball is a different world when it comes to picking up stuff from the outside and processing it and making a big deal out of it. You will hear a lot of that sort of thing in the NFL where there's six days between games. There's a lot of downtime. There's a lot of energy left over for picking up on idle chit chat. Or tweets or Instagram comments, you'll notice that most baseball players don't even have social media accounts that are active. This is why they're busy, okay? They're going from one game to the hotel bed to the next game to the hotel bed to the next game to a charter flight. So, no, I don't think this was something that would have had an impact on the players. I do think, however, that it was yet another case of the Pirates showing publicly what I was told last fall. Think about this for a second. You're a GM who's 
really efficient at keeping things tight-lipped. And by that, I don't just mean Ben Charrington. I'm talking about his inner circle. I'm talking about his scouts. I'm talking about pretty much everyone at every level of the organization is so much more disciplined about keeping things to themselves. There are very few leaks, especially compared to their predecessors, where I could get as a reporter stuff from all over, including all the way at the top of the structure from the CEO, from the team president, from the general manager, from the assistant general manager. So you're that guy, and you're doing your weekly radio show, the one that bears your name, and you bring this up, this stuff about how the internal projections showed that this team was supposed to be nowhere near as good as it's been and everything else. You can't convince me that that isn't being done intentionally, not when it's this individual and he's already got this other pattern of behavior preceding him. He knew exactly what he was saying, and he knew exactly why he was saying it. To bring back that phrase that I've already mentioned, he's lowering the bar, lowering the expectations. These guys, and by that I mean modern baseball executives in general, and this includes Charrington's predecessor, can be slaves to statistics. And when they're shown information that a player is supposed to be this, or a team is supposed to be that, they believe in it as if it's the Holy Bible. Exceptions will come along, great, big exceptions, Jack Wilson having a 200-hit season out of nowhere. Jack Sawinski coming up 20 years later and spraying home runs all over creation. This is the kind of stuff that just floors them, and they see it as just, I don't know, as long as I'm on biblical terms here, an act of God or something that just doesn't make sense. But I can promise you that when this GM got that projection, and this, by the way, is the most damning component to that whole remark, and I never hear people mention this. He heard this projection and did not act on it, meaning someone or multiple someones within his operation had advised him that he was going to have a pretty lousy team in 2023, and he sent that team north to Cincinnati to open the season. That is not to be taken seriously. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone who listens to Daily Shot of Pirates. God only knows why you do. But I'll be back for another one on Monday. 